Well, good morning and welcome to our time of worship of our Lord and Savior today, and we welcome those who are visiting with us. We're certainly glad to see each one and that Lord has blessed us uh, be able to come together. Announcements. Just a couple things. Um, today, of course, obviously after our AM worship service is the first Sunday of the month as we always do have our fellowship time, fellowship meal together uh, in the social hall. So even if you're you're visiting the first time or whatever, you're more than welcome to stay. Uh, our ladies always have more than enough food uh, prepared for us, and so uh, we, we welcome you to stay among us and, and for that time of fellowship and get to, get to just fellowship together, uh, see what the Lord has done in your life in the last week or last month as we share together. Wednesday evening, our prayer time, Bible study at 6.30, uh, the youth ministry as well meeting, and then uh, the second Monday of March and March 14th, 1230, here at the church, uh, the prime timers will be starting to get together again uh, uh, after having a, a winter break. So keep that in mind as well. Prayer requests obviously are listed in the bulletin there. And uh, just, I'll make mention of one um, that Kathy talked with Paula yesterday, I believe it was, and, and uh, of course, Dell is doing pretty well uh, uh, with his, from his surgery. But uh, more importantly, she related to Kathy that uh, David has a procedure, uh, heart procedure uh, testing this coming Friday, and uh, just to keep him in prayer because it is something that he's uh, just always a little bit fearful of in relationship to uh, what has to be done. So just keep him in prayer uh, this week as well and for that whole family and all that they're going through right now. So let's join together and pray prayer as we uh, come before our God. Lord God, we just give you thanks again for just for who you are. Father, we thank you for your holiness, for your justice, for your goodness, for your mercy, that you are omnipotent, omnipresent. Father, we give you thanks for your blessings to us. We pray now that you would turn our hearts and minds to the word of the Lord of God and to singing and to fellowshipping together uh, through the words that are sung, through preaching of the word of God, through the scripture that are read. Lord, help us that we might desire to worship you and to worship you in spirit and in truth, to love you more and to love one another as well uh, in the unity of Christ. For I just prayed in Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to, you can turn um, as we, as I read a few verses in Isaiah chapter 46 in a relationship to, uh, of who God is, of his sovereignty in our lives and in the life of the church and, and in the life of church history, in the life of, of scriptures. Um, as the title of our, Mike's, message today is the unstoppable God and we see those truths and I think the thing that really highlights that is Isaiah chapter 46 beginning at verse 8. Isaiah is writing this and says remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind you transgressors remember the former things of old for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. A little bit of information that I received from uh, uh, 
in, in researching this a little bit uh, from John Piper, we see that this text shows the uniqueness of God. God has declared from the beginning what will be the end. As we see there, he says, I will accomplish my purpose. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. So in the past he has spoken, and yet there are things in the future that will come to pass because he has spoken them in the past and the future will come to pass. What he has purposed in the past, will he will do it. And we see that, as we'll see that today, I, I believe, as, as we continue in the book of Genesis and in the, we see God's working from the beginning, from creation, as at the, of, of bringing about, eventually bringing about um, uh, Christ coming upon this earth for our sins. And through the, through, the gener through the genealogies of all the folks up until that time. He says, my counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purposes. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I will do it. Nothing can stop God from fulfilling his plan. Brothers and sisters, what confidence that should give us. And what should be our response? Well, I think our response should be that we should sing for joy, praising and giving glory to the Lord with cheerful voice. If you are in Christ, you are his flock. So come, let's enter his gates with praise as we stand to sing all people that on earth do dwell. One of, the favorite, one of my favorite hymns. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 5, and it comes right on the heels of the account of um, Ananias and Sapphira and their shortcomings and failures there. And uh, it is yet another account of the apostles teaching and preaching and annoying uh, the Sadducees and the Sadducees yet again throwing them in prison and um, how God works through that. So that being said, let's read our Lord's scripture. We'll start with verse 12 and read through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. 
None of the rest dared join them, but the people hold them in high esteem, held them in high esteem. <clears throat> and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. That as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, and that is the party of the Sadducees. And filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. Then someone came and told them, look, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they said this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census, and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So, in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even find opposing, you might even be found opposing God. So they then took his advice. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. Then when they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Ascends the reading of our God's word. Good morning. I was debating if I was going to say this, but today so far I've thought about my job. I've thought about my rototiller for some bizarre reason in church. So 
if we can, I'm going to ask everybody, please try to focus your thoughts on today's service. This is why we're here. This is what it's meant to be. And we serve a very big God, so let's treat him that way. So let's go to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you that you have given us this day. We thank you that we could come here and worship you. We pray, Lord, that our worship is pleasing to you. We know, Lord, that you control everything. You control this little church. You control this state, this nation, this planet, this galaxy, all the galaxies, Lord you have made and we lord are humbled by that or we should be humbled by that lord we thank you for what you have done but lord we do pray for this world we pray for our nation we pray how christians in our nation can be treated we pray for the nations that surround us we pray how pastors could be imprisoned we think of christians around the world that are in prison we pray for them we pray for their safety we pray for their well-being lord we pray that they are giving you the glory as we should be giving you the glory and we obviously are praying for their release so they can spread the word like the apostles did Lord, we think of what's going on now in the nation of Ukraine. We pray for that. We pray for that situation. We understand that you are in control, Lord, but we see people dying and it hurts us. So we pray for your hand upon that. We pray that may come to a quick and correct ending. Lord, as we focus back on our church, we think of the people in our church that need your help today. Lord, we think of uh, Gabe as what he's going through. We pray for your hand upon him, that the doctors may figure it out and may be directed on what to do. We think of some of the elderly people, Lord. We think of Paul, Moraine. We pray for your hand upon them. May Paul realize that he is now on a different mission field, that he can see people coming to him and he may be able to witness to them. Lord, we thank you for his witness throughout the years. Uh, in this church, and we pray, Lord, that he will continue to do so in where he's at now. Lord, we think of um, Harold friend Molly. We pray for her, Lord. We pray for her well-being. We pray for her healing. Lord, we think of Adele and David, what they're going through right now, what their entire family is going through right now, Lord. Give them peace. Give them well-being. We pray for Adele's well, well-being. We pray for David's uh, result may be well, Lord, with you. Lord, we think of the message that's coming today. We just pray for it. We pray that it's directed by you and that we may be listening, we may be intent to hear you, and we may be intent to spread what we've heard today to others. Lord, we think of the offering that we take, Lord, every week. And Lord, may we use it for your glory and your honor. There's nothing sacred or special about the offering at all, but Lord, it's, it's special what we do with it. And may we honor and glorify you what we do with it. And may we spread it to the nations. May we give of what we have and even more. And Lord, we know that some give so much of what they have, like the widow's might. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for blessing this church. And Lord, we pray for it. We pray for the the history of this church as we're coming up on 50 years, but we pray for the future of this church, Lord. May it grow, Lord. May it not fade away as so many churches have. Lord, we pray it does not turn into a church where people attend to it to go see a concert or people attend to just to have their ears tickled, but we pray, Lord, that there's people that come to it to worship you, to glorify you, and to hear your word. And we think of the fellowship that we have, Lord, later on. May we use that to glorify you as well. In Christ's name, amen.
our sovereign God. I think the words of this song speak for themselves in giving us redemptive history from the beginning of the world until he will return again. I'll have Rachel play this through one time. Uh, we have done this before, but uh, just to get you familiar with it, our sovereign God. Sunday of the month as we will celebrate the Lord's table. Um, we need to be reminded of that as we sing, Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, as we will, uh, after the message, um, be uh, participating in the Lord's table. Yes. 
be seated, please. Did you hear the advice of Gamaliel in our scripture reading? We would be wise to heed it. If this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow it. History and the scriptures show us over and over again that God is unstoppable. No one and no thing can thwart his plans. And yet, in the mystery of his wise providence, he has ordained for things to occur occur that, from our limited human perspective, they, they look like they could block his plans. They look like they could frustrate his purposes. But that has never happened, and it will never happen. God, without failing, overcomes every perceived obstacle. And so today, as we come to the text, let us delight in getting another glimpse of our unstoppable God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we thank you that it is your Spirit who makes the reading and the preaching of your Word effective for convincing and converting sinners and for building up your saints in righteousness and holiness unto salvation. We thank you that these aren't just truths that we believe and that we see in your word, but that things that you truly are doing amongst us. We thank you, Father, that by your spirit, your word has been going forth in power, and we are trusting that you will do so again today, that you will do that invisible work that no man can do, that invisible work that no man can can oppose. No man can truly thwart the working of your spirit by your word. Work in us now. Work in our family members. Work amongst 
those who are guests with us this morning. Work by your spirit and all who are present. We pray for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text for today is Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 32. That's Genesis chapter 11, verses 10 through 32. And as always, I'd invite you to turn there with me. And we're coming upon a pretty big milestone. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the book of Genesis breaks down into two major sections. Chapters 1 through 11 cover the origins of all of creation and especially human history. And chapters 12 through 50 cover the origins of Israel, beginning with a focus on Abraham. And our text today serves as a bridge between these two sections. And like almost everything that Moses has written, I don't know if you've picked up on this or not, I hope you've picked up on it, almost everything that Moses writes, especially in these early chapters, some element, element of it points back to what he's already written, and then some element points forward to what is to come. And we're going to see that again today, and I'd encourage you to keep it in mind as we read the text, beginning, beginning in verse 10, these are the generations of Shem. When Shem was a hundred years old, he fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad five hundred years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived thirty-five years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah four hundred and three years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived thirty years, he fathered Eber. And Shelah lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Ru. And Peleg lived after he fathered Ru 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Ru had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug, and Ru lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Serug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. In spite of everything that has come before, these verses show us that humanity is still chugging along, and that means that the purposes of God are still chugging along. When I planned on preaching through Genesis, did I think about how many times I would have to preach through genealogies? No, I did not. No, I did not. It has been a particular challenge. It has been a growing experience. But it's also uh, in that growing experience, it's been a particular joy. And this morning, I think it would be a fitting time as we come to this, I think this is our third genealogy uh, since we've been in Genesis, I think it'd be a fitting time to review a little bit of what has come before, to see how we got here. And in reviewing, we're going to recall the track record of our unstoppable God. I mean, think about it, with all the things that have happened in the first 11 chapters so far, Humanity shouldn't even exist anymore at this point. Because of man's sin, humanity should be done. And it would be if it were not 
for the working of our sovereign God. Think back to the first obstacle that appeared in Genesis. The very first thing that appeared with the intention of overthrowing God's plans. It was the serpent. Satan invaded God's good garden with the intention of murdering God's good people. He came with craftiness. He came with a guile that exceeded that of the man and the woman. He came with lies ready to deceive. And they fell for it. They fell right into his trap. And yet right then and there, God promised that he would defeat Satan. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This genealogy, we've already alluded to it through what Ron said, this genealogy is going to lead us to that serpent-crushing seed of the woman. It's going to lead us to Jesus Christ because God's plans cannot be stopped by satanic sin. It's so important that we know that. God's plans cannot be stopped by satanic sin. And throughout the scriptures, we see Satan trying. We see his dark domain at work. One of the particular interesting passages to me that I find in the Old Testament of this is in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we have the veil pulled back at one point to see this this spiritual warfare taking place in the heavenlies. But these dark spiritual forces that are associated with foreign nations, they're no match for the angels of God. God, not Satan, is sovereign over the rise and fall of nations. God, not Satan, is sovereign over all of human history. We come to the Gospels and we see the tragic and horrific symptoms of demonic affliction and demonic possession. But what does Jesus do? He he heals. He cleanses. And all he has to use is, is just a word. Just a word. We see that Jesus is the mighty one who has come to bind Satan in his own home. And even now, Satan uses what remaining power he has to try to trouble the church. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. But we're okay. We're going to be okay because God has clothed us with spiritual armor. He's equipped us with spiritual weaponry, and he has promised to crush Satan under our feet. And so we can sing boldly with Martin Luther, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. God's plans cannot be stopped by satanic sin. Furthermore, this genealogy illustrates that God's plans cannot be stopped by human sin. Human sin cannot stop his plans. Again, think back to the garden. You remember the consequence that God threatened for the sin of eating from the forbidden tree. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. When man sinned, we saw the immediate immediate evidence of spiritual death. Yet God mercifully delayed the penalty of physical death. If God had killed him, of course, there's no Genesis 11. There's no genealogy here. But God mercifully gave them time to bear children. God gave Adam time to work the ground. He told Adam, it's going to be toil now. It's going to be rough. One day you're going to die and return to the ground. But still, the ground would produce food to sustain Adam and his family. The fall didn't stop God's plan. Maybe think back to the sin of Cain, who murdered his righteous brother Abel. What hap- what's going to happen if the godly get killed off? Well, God's got it taken care of. He gave Seth in place of Abel. The righteous geneal- the righteous the, the genealogy, pardon me, the genealogy of Genesis 11 is the continuation of that genealogy of Seth. The work of God carrying on in spite of the sin of Cain. And then we saw in chapter 6 how the children of the godly intermarried with the children of the wicked and the whole earth was filled with war and violence. It was so bad. So the, the way the scriptures portray it, it's as if, and this may have been the case, that Noah was the last righteous man on earth. If things continued this way, 
it seemed as if there'd be no one left worshiping God. But God responded with the flood. He put various provisions in place to restrain the wickedness of man. Do you remember these words from Genesis 6-3? Then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. This could be a reference to the shortening of man's lifespan. And did you notice in our passage how the lifespans are getting shorter? If you, if you compare Genesis 11 with the genealogy in Genesis 5, the lifespans have become much shorter. This could be the progressive outworking of God's judgment. After the flood, we just saw the sin of Babel. That appeared to threaten God's plan. God wanted from the beginning humanity to fill the earth. They tried to oppose him in prideful arrogance. But God had his way, didn't he? He confused their languages. They started to spread. We see that in this text. We see Tara's family moving about and relocating because the sin of man can't stop the plans of God. All throughout the scriptures we see this. Sinful men and women rise up and trouble God's people. Sometimes from without the people of God, sometimes they appear to be within the people of God. Men like Achan and Saul and Manasseh in the Old Testament. Our passage in the context of our scripture reading, Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. But none of them can stop God's plans from going forward. Now think about this. To the rebellious, to those who hate God, this truth should be a sobering warning. Your sin will never stop God from accomplishing what He desires. Your rebellion is in vain. It's fruitless. But for the righteous, this same truth, the same exact truth, should be a tremendous comfort to us. Your sin will never stop God from accomplishing what He desires. Well, I want to draw your attention to a third point, but to do so, I want to see how observant you are. Did you notice what was missing in our genealogy? What was missing in our genealogy? If you lined chapter 11 up with chapter 5, most of the language would look almost identical. But there's a little phrase that's missing in chapter 11. And he died. And he died. Repeated over and over in Genesis 5. It's not here. Moses, for some reason, does not put the same emphasis on death in chapter 11. Now, we always need to be careful when we try to make an argument from silence, and I'm trying to exercise some caution here. In fact, I'm not presenting my own arguments. I'm going to present some observations from the commentator, Kenneth Matthews, for your consideration. He has noted that in the previous genealogies of chapter 5 and chapter 10, that in each case, each genealogy was followed by a major catastrophe, the flood and the Tower of Babel, respectively. But what's the genealogy of Shem followed by? We're beginning to get the story of Abraham. We're about to see the promise that God will make to Abraham to, to be a blessing through his family, to be a blessing to many nations. And so Kenneth Matthews argues that the absence of the mention of death reflects the optimism that the new era of Abraham brought. Well, whether or not that's the case, what we can be sure of is that God's plan cannot be stopped by death. Death cannot stop the plans of God. Now, Genesis doesn't give us population figures, but it's possible that millions, even billions of people, have perished by the time that we get to Genesis 11. Man lives and dies, but God's plan endures. Listen how God expresses this truth through the prophet Isaiah. This is Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of Yahweh blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. God's plan marches on in spite of human death. God's plan also marches on in spite of the passing of time. His plans cannot be stopped by time. 
If we were to take all the genealogies and add up the years within them, we would see that these first 11 chapters are covering at least somewhere in the ballpark of 2,000 years of human history. Two millennia have passed since that promise in Genesis 3.15 that that God would bring forth this serpent-crushing seed of the woman, and at this point in the text, he still has not fulfilled that promise. But the continuation of the line of Shem, for faithful Israelites, it should be an encouragement. As they read this, they should have a sense of, he's coming. Be patient. Don't lose heart. God will keep his promises. For us at times, the passage of time feels so slow. Even even when we say, oh, doesn't the time just fly? Doesn't it seem like time gets so much faster as you get older? And yet, To us, it's still much slower than how we see God perceiving time. For our eternal God does not experience time as we do. We read this in Psalm 90, verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. We can go through a few difficult days, a few difficult months, and we might feel as if wondering, if has God forgotten me? Has God forgotten His promises? And even if in your life you're going through difficult decades, maybe your whole life feels like a great trial, and you feel, has God forgotten? Has God failed? The answer of Scripture is clear. No, He has not. And when mockers come and try to get us to think that our God has forgotten us, the Apostle Peter reminds us, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Time is not an obstacle to God. Time is His theater. Time is His canvas. It's through the span of time that he is unstoppably working out his plan of redemption. And he will surely bring it to pass. That's what Peter is encouraging us of. Not one of the elect will perish, but all will reach repentance through God's design. As we're on the topic of considering the passing of time, there is an issue related to our text that I need to address. This is one of those issues that I'm thankful doesn't come up often, but we need to take some time here to address it. The passing of time doesn't just affect human beings. The passing of time affects documents. Documents grow old. They deteriorate. They get copied and recopied. Sometimes human error enters in. Sometimes men intentionally make changes in those documents, and you're wondering, where where am I going with this? We don't have the original papyrus or whatever Moses originally wrote Genesis on. We have copies. We have translations of copies. Even in the New Testament era, they were working with copies and translations of copies. And for our text, for this passage, there are some notable differences between some of these very old copies and translations. And so we wonder, well, which which best reflects the original? Which is faithful to the original? I'm going to keep this very simple today. If it's something that we need to address more fully in the future, that's something that we can do. I've taught a class on this elsewhere in the past, and we we can do that if that would be helpful. But our translation of Genesis follows what we call the Masoretic text. But both the Septuagint, that's the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew, and the Samaritan Pentateuch, and that's what that sounds like, that's the first five books of the Old Testament according to the Samaritan community, these two ancient texts uh, they, they, they disagree with the Masoretic text. Both of these texts add 100 years to the age of nearly everyone in Shem's genealogy. So they push back the age at which these men had children. So where the Masoretic text says so-and-so had a child at age 30, these texts say he had the child at, at 130. And the result is they're having children later, they're living longer, And those older patriarchs, like Shem, who has a very long life, aren't outliving their more distant descendants. 
But even the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch aren't identical. They're not even identical on all these numbers. They handle the numbering of ages differently. And the Septuagint includes a whole extra person. It places Canaan between Arpachshad and Shelah. And we see in Luke's genealogy, in chapter 3 of Luke's gospel, Luke seemingly follows the Septuagint, or at least the tradition being preserved by the Septuagint, including Canaan in the genealogy of Christ, a name not mentioned in Genesis 11. Now again, I, I want you to be, you may come across this, and I want you to be prepared should you come across this. There are those who try to use this information against the church, and they try to convince us we can't really know what the Word of God is. Oh, there's these irresolvable contradictions. You can't trust the Word of God. And some Christians respond to this, and I would say that this is the way that I was taught in high school to respond to this. Put on blinders. Just pretend those aren't there. Pretend there aren't any textual differences in these old copies. Plug your ears and just say, I can't hear you. Then you don't have to worry about this issue. And brothers and sisters, I'm sharing this not because the ages of the patriarchs is of some great theological importance. Uh, their ages, in one sense, are relatively insignificant but our confidence in the Word of God is of great importance. That is what is of great importance here. And I'm sharing this in part because I don't want you to have a blind faith. The Scriptures don't call us to a blind faith, but to an informed faith, an educated faith. And so there may be at times where we debate whether the Masoretic text or the Septuagint is more a faithful witness regarding the particular, uh, this particular passage or that particular passage. There may be times where we debate, well, what, what, how could we best make sense of this? How can we best reconcile uh, Luke uh, chapter 3 with Genesis chapter 11? Uh, could it be that Luke includes a name that, 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 that Moses did not, that Moses' genealogy was more selective and that Moses uh, skipped some generations? There's, there's possibilities like that. We may have debates and disagreements at times at what best explains these matters. But a knowledge of these matters should encourage us to approach such issues with humility. And I would let you know, if you're not aware of this, this isn't anything new. Augustine addressed this in his day, and I appreciate his counsel. He says, if you chance upon anything in Scripture that does not seem to be true, you must not conclude that the sacred writer has made a mistake. Rather, your attitude should be, the manuscript is faulty, or the version is not accurate, or you yourself do not understand the matter. And so, are there differences in some of these ancient copies? Yes, but here's what I want to draw you to and how I think this ties into our theme this morning. In spite of these differences, the fact that we have these many, many copies, these well-preserved copies, in spite of this, their existence has served, it has actually served to preserve the Word of God. It has preserved the Word of God. It's good for us to recognize that the passing of time has not destroyed the Word of God because God, by His singular care and providence, has kept His Word pure in all ages. And so even when we investigate and debate the quality of our translation or we look at which manuscript we think is more accurate I think that we will find that we can have great confidence in our modern translations. And I love these words from the translators of the 1611 King James Bible. They wrote this in the preface of the original 1611. They wrote, We do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation, meanest here means most basic, not not as good as ours, is kind of what they're saying. The very meanest translation of the Bible in English, set forth by men of our profession, containeth the word of God. Nay, is the word of God. God's purposes and plans continue on today through the reading and the preaching of his word. Well, so far we've seen that neither satanic sin, nor human sin, nor death, nor the passing of time can stop the unstoppable God. But now I want to draw your attention to a new perceived obstacle. It's one that has not come up in Genesis yet. This is our first time encountering it. Look at verse 30. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. 
This is the wife of the man whom God is going to promise to make into a great nation. This is the wife of the man whom God is going to change his name from Abram to Abraham because he says he's going to make him into the father of a multitude of nations. This is the wife of the man through whom the promised seed is supposed to come. And she's barren. If you know Abraham's story, Sarah, Sarah's barrenness is going to be a major issue. It's going to be such an issue that Abraham is going to try to take matters into his own hands at multiple times. At multiple times, he's going to try to fulfill God's promises in his own strength, and it's going to create trouble multiple times. Sarah will even laugh at the thought of God overcoming her barrenness in her old age. And yet that's exactly what God will do. God's plans cannot be stopped by barrenness. For the God who created the heavens and earth out of nothing, creating, the li- creating life in the womb of a barren old woman, is, it's easy. And it's not a one-time thing. Not only do we see multiple instances of God overcoming barrenness throughout the Scripture, we can consider what's more barren than an old childless woman, a young virgin girl. Mary's virginity, which was like unto a sort of barrenness, would not stop God from giving life to Jesus Christ in her womb. Where man says it's improbable or it's impossible is exactly where God delights to do his greatest work. And in this, I want us to consider this for a moment. This should be a great comfort to the childless Christian couple. couple. This should be a great comfort to the single Christian who yearns for marriage but cannot find a spouse. God's plans cannot be stopped by barrenness. Not the barrenness of Sarah. Not your barrenness. So even if you never know the joy of having biological children... In God's providence, you may know the greater joy of having sons and daughters in the faith. Those younger Christians who you nurture in Christ. Like Paul, God may mercifully and graciously grant to you a a Timothy, a true son in the faith. Like John, he may give you a Gaius so that you may be able to say, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Well, there's a final obstacle here that I believe that the text presents, but it's a little harder to see. Look down at the names that you see at the end, the names of Tara's family members. We're going to focus on their relations and their movements more in our next sermon, but just consider their names for now. A number of them, and this is curious, a number of them have names that relate to the moon. Tara's name is very similar to the Hebrew word for moon and the Hebrew word for lunar month. Sarai's name is equivalent. It is the equivalent of a name of the name for a Sumerian false goddess who was considered to be the consort of the moon god. Milka is the same name as the daughter of the moon god. And Laban's name means white or the white one, which was a very common way in ancient poetry of referring to the full moon. On top of this, we know that in antiquity, the locations of Ur and Haran were prominent centers of moon worship. All of this suggests to us that the line of Shem, where where it's coming to an end in chapter 11, that the line of Shem is ending temporarily in a family of moon worshipers. It has led us to a family of idolaters. And even if we didn't know these connections with uh, moon worship, if we didn't know some of this extra biblical information, we would still know from, the, from God's word that Terah's family, that they were idolaters. It's said explicitly in Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. God's plans will not be stopped by idolatry. God's plans cannot be stopped by idolatry. How striking is this that the first patriarch of Israel grew up in idolatry? And when God 
for the people who have come into Canaan in Joshua 24. They've come into the land, and when God summarizes their story for them, this is where he starts. You used to worship other gods. That's where I brought you from. That's where you come from. And it's good for us to remember this morning, Abraham isn't just the father of Israel. Abraham, Scripture tells us, is the father of all who believe. This is our background. God would have us see, this is where you come from. Think about how Abraham came out of that world. He didn't pull himself out of sin and idolatry. God did. God saved Abraham by his grace. Abraham, and again, you will see this in the months ahead, the weeks and months ahead. Abraham wasn't declared righteous because of his works. Abraham indeed was unrighteous. We'll see multiple instances of unrighteousness in the life of Abraham. But he was declared righteous through faith in Christ. Christ tells us explicitly in John 8 that Abraham was looking forward to Christ's day. And he tells us that Abraham saw Christ's day. And he was glad. And so it is for all of God's elect. God, by his own grace and his good pleasure, he is the one who calls us out of belief, out of unbelief. He is the one who calls us out of idolatry. And he draws us to Christ. And when we see Christ, he fills us with gladness. We are glad that Christ is the one who has mortally wounded Satan's head. We are glad that Christ has lived righteously on our behalf. Aren't you glad that Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins? Aren't you glad that he has overcome death so that we will be raised with him? Aren't you glad that he, raise, that he reigns forever as our Lord and as our God? If it were not for the unstoppable work of God, we would all be lost. We would all be lost. But we thank God that Christ's mission to say, seek and save the lost, his mission could not be stopped. He finds us. He takes hold of us. And he never lets us go. One man reflected on it this way. When I move away from him and attempt like the prophet Jonah to flee, he is there waiting for me. When I sin and rebel against him, seeking my own interests, I can't get away. He envelops me with his love, calls me to repentance, and melts away my sin and sinfulness. Who is this hound of heaven who won't let me go, who pursues, captures, and overwhelms me with his love and forgiveness? And maybe some of you have been experiencing God's work in your life, but you don't know how to express it. You don't know how to put words to it. You don't understand it exactly. Maybe as you hear the preaching of God's word, you hear your heart warming toward Christ. Maybe you're losing a joy in the things of this world. Maybe you're beginning to grieve over your sin. Do not fight against God's work. Do not fight against God's work. You cannot escape the hound of heaven. Thank God that you cannot escape the hound of heaven. Even today, you may come to Christ in faith and repentance, and he will welcome you and never cast you out. Brothers and sisters, before we close, let us spend some time contemplating this truth that our God is unstoppable. Since these things are true, why are you anxious? Why are you anxious? Why are you worried about tomorrow? Why are you worried about the economy? Why are you worried about your children's future? Why are you worried about COVID or cancer? Why are you worried about what you'll eat and what you'll drink and what you'll wear? Are you worried about a possible cold war and global instabilities and mad men with nuclear weapons? None of these things will stop God's plans or purposes from coming to pass. It's important to, for us to know that none of our anxieties will help God's plans and purposes come to pass. Our anxieties will not help these things come to pass, but our anxieties will spoil our enjoyment of God's goodness today. God's word does instruct us to act with prudence. This is not a call to foolishness. God's word instructs us to act with prudence, to pray for God's provision, to seek his kingdom. But the moment that we start to worry, 
the moment that fear of tomorrow enters in, we've passed into sin. And we have forgotten our unstoppable God. Why, we would never be anxious about these things if we were looking and remembering that our God is truly unstoppable. Since these things are true, why are you doubting? Why are you doubting? In our sinfulness, sometimes we believe that these things that are preached are true for others, but not for us. And what a wretched way of thinking that is. We wrongly think that our past and our sins are too big for God. We believe that He forgives and loves others, but surely He's ready to give up on me. Maybe He already has. We can be like that schoolgirl picking petals off the daisy. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. You must not think that your sin is greater than God's grace. His unstoppable grace was sufficient for Adam, the rebel, and for Noah, the drunkard, and for Abraham, the idolater. And His grace is sufficient for you. Your sin cannot stop the unstoppable love of Christ. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is there left to stop us? What is there left to separate us from God? Nothing. Nothing. Since these things are true, why are you not rejoicing? Why are you not rejoicing? How many days do we wake up on the wrong side of the bed and then spend the day grouchy and bitter and complaining? We let negativity roost in our minds and spew out of our mouths. We forget who we are. We aren't children of the world anymore. We are children of the unstoppable God. When the world looks at us, shouldn't they see? I'm not going to make it a question. They should see the joy and the gladness that we have in knowing our unstoppable God. The world should not see despair in us, but hope. They should see hope. Now, now if our gaze, if we're only looking at each other, if, if we go out after this service and we have a fellowship meal and we take our focus off of who our God is and just focus on each other, not each other with God in view, but just each other, we're going to see what a pitiful lot we are. We're going to see how sorry we are, and we are going to feel sorry for ourselves. We're going to fear that the church's best days are behind her. But if we are looking at our unstoppable God, if we keep Him in view, we will remember and we will be confident that Christ will build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When the Scriptures make that promise, brothers and sisters, be assured that this local body is included in that promise. If we look at the storm clouds, if we just look at our circumstances, maybe even we go through times like Paul. When, do you remember when Paul was on that ship and he described it as neither, they, they could neither see sun nor stars for many days? We go through seasons like that. If all we do is look at the storm, surely we will lose heart. But if we look at our unstoppable God... We will know that behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. He is for us, even in the midst of the storm. It will not stop him. And so may the genealogy of Genesis 11 remind us that if our hopes were in the plans of man, we would be doomed to fail. But we rest in the unstoppable plans of God that no man can overthrow. Would you pray with me? Father, we confess that we often stray from this truth and from an awareness of this truth. And so we thank you, Father. Oh, how good you are to remind us. We need this reminder that you can't be stopped. That you are for us. You are for your people. You are working in our lives. You take even trials and turn them on their head. And they're for our good so that we can rejoice in trials. 
That seems crazy when we're not looking at you, God. Even death, even death, what is that to you? You teach us to mock death. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You've defeated death. We thank you that you've done all these things in our Lord Jesus Christ and by uniting us to him through faith. We continue to celebrate these things now with your help. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to receive the Lord's Supper, I remind you that this is something that we do by commandment of our Lord. He is the one who instituted this. We read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We've been speaking about perceived obstacles to God's plan, and the apostles didn't initially understand how Christ's death could fit into God's plan. But his death was exactly according to plan. God predestined the death of the innocent Christ for our forgiveness. They thought the grave was an obstacle. Do you remember the disciples on the the Emmaus Road? They said, we had hoped. In the past tense, as if they had given up hope. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. And they were surprised to find out that Jesus was no longer in the grave. Jesus was the one walking with them. Christ's burial was part of God's unstoppable plan for our salvation. Even the ascension at first appeared to be an obstacle. The same evening where Jesus inaugurated uh, the Lord's Supper, he told them that he was going away. And they panicked. And sometimes maybe we panic over this. Sometimes maybe we think, wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to do this anymore and Jesus were just physically present with us? Wouldn't that be better? No. No. The Scripture tells us that. The Scripture tells us that this is exactly according to God's plan, and this is exactly what is best for us. And in fact, this meal testifies. Is Christ physically absent from us? Yes. But He is with us. This meal testifies to His ongoing fellowship with us. He is with us, and He is nourishing us by His Spirit, particularly in this meal. And so we must come to this meal knowing that the cross was victory not defeat. It was part of God's plan, not an obstacle. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that Christ has died to save you from your sins, and if you don't believe that he lives to sustain you and to sustain you in communion with God, then this meal is not for you. We hope that you'll come to believe that. We love that you're here, and we hope that you'll continue to come here and hear this message. But if you do not believe these things, these things, Please let the elements pass by and do not partake. Maybe you would say, though, that you have trusted Christ, and yet this morning you are knowingly living with a matter of sin that you are unwilling to repent of. Maybe you're knowingly refusing to forgive someone. If you can eat this meal and be okay with that, that actually shows that you don't really understand the meaning of this meal or the meaning of what Christ did on the cross. And if that's the case, you should not eat. However, I would encourage you to repent. If there's something that the Lord brings to mind, the Scriptures do instruct us to examine ourselves before we eat. And in that examination, if something comes to mind, if you claim the name of Christ, then now's the time to repent so that you can eat rightly. The only proper way to eat is by knowingly depending on Christ, forsaking sin and self. And so if you know that you are a sinner, but you're resting in Christ's death, then come and eat. And if you know you're a sinner, but you know that you need to be nourished by the living Christ, then come and eat. And if you know that you are a sinner, but you are waiting, you are longing for the soon return of Christ, then come and eat. 
At this time, I'm going to bless both of the elements, and then the brothers are going to come and distribute them, and we will partake of both of them together. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great goodness to us, that you don't just give us word, but you give us the symbol as well. You give us a picture of what Christ has done. You give us a tangible piece of bread that we can hold in our hand, and even though nothing is changing, it's still just bread. We, in a sense, are given that experience of holding the body of Christ in our hand. We drink the cup, and there's a true sense spiritually in which we are partaking in the blood of Christ. We thank you for this, Father, that you are showing us that the once for all sacrifice is not, that Christ may on the cross, that not only is it true and effective, that it is true and effective for us. We have truly become partakers in Christ. We thank you for that, Father, and we pray that you would bless these elements for that very purpose, to remind us, Father, of who we are in him, to remind us that we not only have Christ, but we have Christ and all the benefits of his death. And Father, may it be a solemn time where examination still needs to take place in the remaining moments. May that take place. May it be a solemn time of confession, a solemn time of repentance, But may it also be a sober time of celebration, Father. May we not do this without rejoicing in what Christ has done and how he has given us hope. Lead us forward now in this time for our good and your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If the brothers would come.
took the bread, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks. Father, how can we not rejoice with all that you've done amongst us this morning? Thank you for how you've shown yourself to us again, and not just from afar, but you've come near by your Spirit. You've been with us. You've ministered to us. You've blessed your people. We thank you for that. Would you help us to go rejoicing and in this strength to love one another, to fellowship together, to show that this is not only a bond of our peace and fellowship with you, but our bond of peace and fellowship with each other, that we truly are brothers and sisters in Christ. May that come out in a glorious way in the meal to follow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. that they went out and sang a hymn. And we think about of our unstoppable God through redemptive history and through what we've been learning in the book of Genesis. We can't help but uh, I really appreciate what Mike had to say. You know, we have nothing to doubt because God is sovereign. Nothing's going to stop God. And as a result of that, I think we just really need to stand and sing, rejoice, the Lord is king knowing that Christ has come through redemptive history, through an unstoppable God, and that Christ indeed is king. Let's stand together. Between the third and the fourth verse, there will be a key change. dismiss you. Father, indeed, we, we just give you thanks for, once again, your many blessings to us today. Just ask now, Lord, that you would bless our time of fellowship together, uh, that the fellowship would be sweet. We thank you, Father, for all the food has been prepared and uh, uh, providing for us. 
to nourish our, our to nourish our bodies as well as hearing this day the, uh, the nourishment for our souls and uh, we just love you Lord we pray that indeed you would uh, continue to show your mercy and kindness to each one of us uh, throughout the throughout this day and throughout the coming week and I just pray that part in Jesus name and now may the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord amen you are dismissed if you give the ladies a little time to get things set up uh, you can join together in fellowship back there or uh, just fellowship here